Where you're at this morning, I just ask that you raise your hands, start worshiping your God this morning. He's worthy of all of our praise. He's worthy of everything that we can give him this morning. I wonder if just wherever you're at this morning, if you could just let heaven hear you in your home today. Somebody call on his name. I love you, Jesus. I love you, Jesus. I love you, Jesus. Worship with us today as we see.
Luke 15. This morning, a very, very familiar passage of scripture I'm going to read from. Um, but I'm going, to, I'm going to use it in a little different way today. Um, Luke 15, 11, and we'll read through 24. A certain man had two sons, and the younger of them said to his father, Father, give me the portion of goods that fall to me. And he divided unto them his living. And not so many days after, the younger son gathered all together and took his journey into a far country. And there wasted his substance on riotous living. And when he had spent all, there arose a mighty famine in the land, he began, and he began to want. And he went and joined himself to a citizen of that country, and he sent him into his fields to feed swine. And he would, have, he would fain have filled his belly with the husk that the swine did eat, and no man gave unto him. And when he came to himself, he said, how many hired servants of my father's have bread enough and to spare, and I perish with hunger? I will arise and go unto my father, and I will say unto him, Father, I have sinned against heaven and before thee, and am no more worthy to be called thy son, and make me as one of thy hired servants. And he arose and came to his father. But when he was yet a great way off, his father saw him. And had compassion, and ran and fell on his neck, and kissed him. And the son said unto him, Father, I have sinned against heaven, and in thy sight, and am no more worthy to be called thy son. But the father said to his servants, Bring forth the best robe, and put it on him, and put a ring on his hand, and shoes on his feet, and bring me hither the fat calf, and kill it. And let us eat and be merry. For this my son was dead, and is alive again. He was lost. And it's found, and they begin to be married. Let's pray this morning. Father God, we thank you for this word. We ask you, Lord, to touch our hearts and touch our minds, God. God, we want something from you this morning. God, help us to get something out of this word. In your mighty name, in the mighty name of Jesus. Amen. You may be seated. As I said before, this is a very, very familiar passage of scripture. We know this to be likened unto a backslider that leaves and returns to the church. Um, I want to use it in a little different way this morning, and I'll get to that later. I want to use one, one scripture there. And this pertains to everybody. This pertains to the backslider that left and, and comes back. It pertains to the lost sinners. Right. It pertains to you may be in the church and you may be cold a little bit, but you, you, you need to you get right. And I'll get to it later. The story is about a young brother took his inheritance Went out and he wasted on righteous living. He he, yeah. he was wild and, and uncontrolled. He right. he wanted to, and it seems you know I, I see this pattern a lot a lot of a lot of people that were raised in the church they go out and they want to be the wildest craziest and I, I, you see it all the time and that's what this young man did. He went out to seek pleasures and to fulfill his fleshly desires, uh, if you will. Yeah. There came a day when the money ran out. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, he could no longer afford the pleasures. That he went after, that he desired. Um, there came a great famine in the land, and uh, he didn't have any money. He didn't have any. He couldn't buy a place to, to hang his head. He couldn't buy food. He became hungry, and he and he needed a place. He needed shelter, right. he, you know, from the storms, from the wind, rain, whatever was there. He needed shelter. So he met a person of that country, and they sent him out, put him to work feeding hogs. Yeah. And the Bible says. In verse 16, he would fain have filled his belly with the husk that the swine did eat. Or he would have gladly, or he would have desired to fill his belly that the, uh, you know, that the, the husk that the, the hogs were eating. Some translations say the husk were a type of fruit or bean plant. Others say it was like a locust pod. To us, we know a husk. To us, a husk is around a uh, corn cob. But whatever, regardless of what it was, he became hungry. He wanted right. yeah. something. Yeah. Yeah. And right. in 17, if I could draw your attention back to there. And when he came to himself, he said, How many hired servants of my father's have bread enough to spare, and I perish with hunger? And that's where I want to take my title. And when I came to myself. Yeah. My title is, The Day I Came to Myself. The day Rory Baker came to himself and realized, 
I need help. Right. Um, when he could finally see through sin's misery, he realized daddy's house had a lot more to offer right. than maybe it was a little strict. Maybe his rules were too much for somebody. Uh, but even the servants, he, he, he said, even the servants are treated better than me. They right. have extra food. Yeah. Extra food. They have clothes, and shoes. Yeah. Uh, we know the ending, you know, he, he went to his father, and he, or he was talking to himself, and he said, you know, I'm going to go to my dad, and say, yeah, I'm going to ask for repentance, and I'm going to say, I'm not worthy to be your servant, but make me as one of your hired, or I'm not worthy to be your son, but make me as your hired servant. Right. Yeah. And the father, no doubt, he, he saw him a long way off, and he probably recognized his walk in that gate, and said, oh, here comes Rory, he's coming home today, and he was glad. Yeah. It said it said he had compassion on him. He wasn't mad at him. He went and squandered everything. He wasted everything. He wasn't mad about that. He's glad he was glad he came home. That's right. You know, I grew up in this great truth. I grew up in this church. Uh, but I never truly had a walk with God. I I rode on the coattails of my parents. Uh, and let me say this, you're not gonna get to heaven doing that. Right. You're not going to get to heaven holding on to mama's apron strings, if you will. We hear that a lot. But there's security in mama's apron strings. You know, oh, yeah. We get a little nervous. My little boy, Mason, you'll see him. He's up against me all the time because he knows. He knows that daddy's safe. You know, he'll protect him. Right. But you're not going to get to heaven right now. Daddy's coattail or mama's right. apron string. Right. You're right. not going to do it. Right. And so I never truly had a walk with God. From time to time, there were times, you know, I would feel God. We'd have revival, we'd have youth camps, we'd have different things, meetings, and I would feel God, and I would feel His presence. But nothing, I never had a prayer life. Yeah. I never had a walk with God, a daily walk. I never had that bread, that fed, you know, I didn't read the Bible. Uh, I just came to church. That's My friends were there, and, and that's what I did. And so... Uh, I, I got into the job world, and I, I started the job at Nash, the trailer factory, and, and you know, a lot of those spirits wore on me. Oh, yeah. And I, I, they, they really did. I mean, they got, because I didn't have that walk with God, I, I wasn't told, I wasn't anchored in Him. Right. Uh, and so at the age of 23, I made the decision. Uh, I left the church. I walked away from God, turned my back on Him, and my wife stayed in church. And I just thought, I'm going to do my thing. I'm going to go out my way and do my thing. And really, and that's all it was. I wasn't mad at the church. I wasn't, didn't have any odd against anybody, really. Uh, I just wanted to do my thing. I wanted to go hunt and fish and be out in the world. And, you know, you hear guys say, God wants me to be in the woods because that's, that's my church. Well, I don't know about that. But that, that was me. I wanted to be out there. I didn't want nobody to tell me what to do. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, and, and so, through this journey, I left the church and I started building myself up in the world's standards, in the world's eyes. I got a job. I, I worked for Parker's for a while, Brother Bishop Parker, Pastor Parker, climbing trees, you know, and we did that for a while. And I always wanted to be the best at everything I did. And so, after that, I went to Pipeline Company, Brothers and Pipeline, and I built myself up there. Man, I, was, I started at $13 an hour. Boy, that was not very good money <laughs> from what I came from. But through this, through this, I, I became, you know, I got, um, became an operator, got my CDL, you know, got all these things, promotion. And in the world's standards, in the world's eyes, I was something, man. I was, I became a welder. And when you're a welder, a pipeline welder, man, you're just, you, you, nobody can touch you. They think. Uh, their attitudes think, much like roughnecks and, I mean, they just, everybody is way down here, and you're, you, <laughs> you just can't touch them. So I built myself up in the world. I was blessed enough to excel at pretty much everything I did. Um, not bragging, but just got, he blessed me that way. And so uh, through time, I, uh, you know, I became an equipment operator. Um, I could fuse pipe, you know, a big deal. I became a foreman, welder, you know, all that stuff. And I, be, I thought I was somebody in the world's eyes. We can't, you start making good money, I mean, like 20 bucks an hour, you know. Around here, that's pretty good money. Yeah. Yeah. 
But I became the best, or tried to become the best in the world, okay? I tried, in, in my eyes, I was something. And so yeah. in June of 2015, I was offered a job in Lewiston, Idaho. And I thought, well, I don't know, you know, the guy that got me the job, he bragged on me a little bit, told this guy some stuff, and uh, we got together, called him, set it up. I said, I would like to come over for a week and just try out and see if you like me. And if you do, I'll stay or whatever. We'll just go from there. And so I went over there and I worked for a week and he was impressed. He said, I want you. But it took me two months. I went home and this was the hardest decision of my life. The hardest decision. Because I was raised around here. And the church, you know, the thing about the church is I was always around the edges of it. Yeah. I always stayed in tune with what was going on. All right. You know, but I never... I, I, I don't think I stepped foot in the church for many, many years. Uh, honestly, I, I, I just kind of didn't want to be in, in the church. Uh, anyhow, I take, I, so that was in uh, August of 2015. I took the job. Hardest decision of my life. I cried. I had a migraine. I was welding that day. Um, I, I was in Union. We did a cutoff. I remember details of where I was and what I did. And I made the decision to move. I thought, we're going to move, I'm going to pack up my family. Well, I made the decision to take the job in August. And so I, I worked over there for two months, drove back and forth every weekend. Back and forth, back and forth. And in October 2015, we moved. We packed up everything, and I told my wife, I said, you know, I think this is good. You know, I tried to sell it to her. You know, I knew what I was doing. I was running. Running in, in the area even farther away from, yeah. the church. you know, the church. Yeah. You, know, you yeah. just... And so, but I thought, you know, I'm going to go over there, and Nate, Brother Nate talked to Bishop, and he said, hey, he, he wants to go restart his life and find a church, and he told me a church to go to. And, you know, I went there, but it just, it wasn't, it wasn't Lighthouse Church. Uh, it wasn't. And so, anyhow, my plan was to go there, restart, and go to church and uh, my way, and I want it my way, and we all want it that way. Yeah. You know, we all want it our way. And so... Uh, we lived in Lewiston until April of 2018, two and a half years, a little over two and a half years. During this time, we never really made friends. We never really got um, close to people. Sure, there was co-workers, there was people that I knew, I worked with, um, but I never became close with anybody. I had my buddy Daniel, Daniel and Sissy, you guys know him. If you're watching, I love you, man. Um, but we didn't have anybody else that we hung out with. Uh, every two weeks, we would drive over to La Grande. Every two weeks for two and a half years, and sometimes more. <laughs> we would drive to La Grande from Lewiston to visit friends and family. Hmm. We wanted, what we were looking for was love. We were looking for yeah. fellowship, right. we were looking right. for friendship. Yeah. And that would give us a little bit during that time, but every time we left, it was sadness, and, and you are just going back to misery grief and loneliness. Right. And so that's why we kept coming back. In, in January 2017, I began to have health problems. Me and Daniel and I were up in Pullman, Washington. We were working, putting a service or something in. And I, we, ate, we were eating at a Japanese restaurant. And I had barely ate, but I felt full. And I'm like, this is crazy. And I told him that. I go, man, I don't feel good. So I ordered some little miso soup, which, you know, I thought, you know, it's healthy, it'll help my stomach. Uh, but I felt full, you know, and I'm like, man, I barely ate. And so we, we were working in Pullman that whole week, I think it was. And and so after about three four days of that, I go, dude, I got to go to the walk-in clinic because I do not feel good. Like, my stomach hurts. So I walk in there, you know, and these guys are, they're just, you know, they're not specialists. But, and so I tell him all this stuff, and he takes all these uh, different things and asks me certain things. And he said, you know, the bottom line is we're not miracle workers. And you're going to need some further, you're going to need more testing. Well, that didn't stop them from giving my money back. They still took my money. <laughs> Couldn't do anything. But, <laughs> you know, a month or so later, it got worse. got worse, worse through time. I didn't know. I'm just going to say this right here, but I didn't know at this time God was getting a hold of me. 
really, truly, he was getting a hold of me in a way that only he can. Right. And, and it got worse, and so I had an MRI schedule. So I went out, and I went to this MRI, and they put me in this tube, and, they, and I thought, this is weird because it should be down near my stomach area, but they had the deal up near my head. And so I'm like, huh, all right, maybe it has something to do with your head. So they took an MRI on my head. And so I went to my doctor and I said, why did they take an MRI on my head? It's stomach problems. That was a couple thousand dollars I paid for. My brain was okay, I guess, at that time. But they rescheduled. I went in and they did this uh, uh, like radioactive casket. And they stick this stuff in your veins and you feel like you're on fire. And the result of that was nothing. Couldn't find anything wrong. Even the brain scan, nothing. No, nothing there. I had had a, uh, a gas accident when I was here in the Grand, and I opened the valve, and it kind of thousands of shavings went up in my face. I got it was just a bad deal. But that MRI showed all them pieces still up in my nostril, up in certain cavities of my head. Uh, anyhow, I had an endoscopy where they take that tube and they go down and they check all your innards. Your, your upper stomach, and then I think they get into the second part of that. And the result of that, nothing. Except a mild form of gastritis. Mild form, you know, not, it, really nothing there. My vision became blurry through all this. This is all through a period of, of about a year and a half, two years. <clears throat> My vision became blurry. I was a welder on the pipelines. I would go out, I would drive to work. I remember driving down 17th Street to Lewiston down thing, and I mean, I'm talking, I was, I'm trying to like, see where I'm going, I mean, I was half blind, I'm telling you, I could not see. I went and had a, my vision checked. The result of that, the doctor was like, you have 20-20 vision, I'm like, it can't be. There's no way, I'm telling you right now, I cannot see. God, you know, he's getting a hold of me <laughs> in a way that only he knows how. Right, yeah. Uh, I started having bladder and prostate troubles. You know, it started stomach, and then it just kind of went everywhere. <laughs> Why? I don't know, you know, but God get a hold of me. I started having bladder and prostate trouble, so I went in, had my bladder scanned, had my prostate checked, all that stuff. And that's some pretty humiliating stuff. But I had it checked, and the result was nothing. Nothing was wrong with me. And so, during all this, during all this time, the loneliness, remember the driving back and forth to find right. friendship and to find love, the loneliness was getting worse and worse. Yeah. And, the, and I really fell into like a state of depression, really. And I thought many, many times, I should just take my life. Is this life even worth living anymore? Yeah. Should I go on with this thing or should I take my life? I thought that many times. Many, many times I had the vision of, taking a pistol, and just ended it all. But then I thought back to the preacher. I thought back as a young man, and that's, I'm thankful for, I'm thankful for a pastor, I'm thankful for a preacher that's not afraid to tell like it is. Not afraid. And I thought back, and I thought, you know, he always said, the bishop always said, that he felt like uh, suicide was the ultimate form of devil worship, so I don't want to do that. So what else is there? Yeah. So I sat there and I, I, I just kind of became more depressed, more alone. My wife too. My wife was ready to come home. She told me many, many times, I'm ready to go home. Oh, yes. uh, we, she looked for houses over here. She was like, this place is for rent. I'm like, we can't afford to go back there. You're going to pay me nothing. You know, I just made all the excuses in the world. I was making $55 an hour when I left the list. 55 an hour. Not many people. That's double what I was making here, a little more. Um, and I tried to buy the house. I tried to buy all that stuff. Um, I would go from hobby to hobby. Coffee roast, that was the last one, but you know, building chains, I'd buy them by the dozens and rebuild them and sell them. And, but I was looking for fulfillment. I was looking for filling. I was looking for happiness. Something to fill the void inside. Amen. Uh, in 2018, 2018, this, this is probably the most memorable part of my coming back to church. It, we, there was a baby dedication here. That I think it was February 2018. There was a baby dedication at this church. 
And we've dedicated all our kids. We've always done it. My wife did. I was out of church for 12 years. And so during that period of time, um, in 2009, I was out of church. Micah, he was dedicated. But my wife had brought them to the church and dedicated them. And so she wanted to dedicate my daughter. We lived over there. We were coming over anyway. And I'm like, well, go ahead. And she wanted me there. You, you need to come push me. And I'm like, I don't, I don't want to go to church. And I don't want anything to I mean, I did. I wanted everything to do with the church. Yeah. But yet I couldn't humble myself enough to do it. Um, and so we came. And I'll never forget. You, you, many of you have heard this before, but I'll never forget. Because this was the turning point in my life. Right over here. Right over here, I stand. And they went down the line and they prayed for all the families and the kids and whatever. And I was standing right there and Sister Parker, she puts her arm around me. And if I cry, you forgive me because it means a lot to me. It means the world to me. Because I felt like somebody cared. And when she put her arm around me, I thought, I don't know if I thought it or felt it, but it was like home. This is home. This is where the peace, this is where I need to be. This, th those were the things I thought. And it was a couple weeks later, and this is where I came to myself. I go back to verse 17. This is the part where I came to myself. I finally had enough. I was in my shop. I don't know if I was roasting coffee. I don't know if I was building chains. I don't remember. But what I do remember is I had had enough. And I, at this time, I was having like dreams of Bishop preaching. And he was in my head. And I'm just like, what is going on with me? What is, what is the deal here? And I finally had enough. And I looked up with tears rolling out of my eyes. And I gritted my teeth. I was in my shop by myself. And I said, God. If you'll make a way for me to get home, I'll go right now. That's what I, I, that's what I told him. I'll go right now. I was sick of it. I was sick of the life I was living, right. the misery, the shame, all that stuff. Yeah. I came to myself in the shop that day. April 1st, just last Wednesday. Last Wednesday was two years since I prayed through it. Two years since I prayed through it. Look what God has done. I would never dream, never, never in a million years dream I would be standing before you preaching. Never. But that's what God can do. Right. God can make a way when there is no way. But here's the deal, and I'm, I'm about done. It's, there, there's going to be a time in your life, whether you're a prodigal, whether, you, like I said before, whether you're just straight up sinner, and you're looking for something, or whether you're in the church lot, there's got to come a time in your life where you come to yourself right. and realize there's more to right. this. I need to get God in my life. I need the Holy Ghost in my life. I need the power of Him yeah. to show me what to do in this life. you got to come to yourself. And, you know, it's like, are you tired of living in sin? Are you ready for a change in your life this morning? Much like I was ready over here. I was ready. I was ready for a change in my life. Yes. The beautiful thing about it is. In, if you go back to. Verse 24. This is the beautiful part of it. This is where. You know the father had compassion. And he ran. And why did he do that? He said for this my son was dead. And is alive again. He was lost. And is found. See, I was lost. I was in a lost state. Right. But the Lord found me, you know, in only his way. Everybody deals, he deals with people differently. But this is how he dealt with me. And I'll tell you what, when I came back to church April 1st and I prayed through, it wasn't, I don't know, I was ready, I guess. I, I truly, I was sitting back there in the third row where I always sat. And I thought, all right, well, the altar call, I'll go up there and, you know, just show that I, I was dressed up, playing the part, you know. I hadn't stepped in church in years. And I came down and I passed the back, and Dion was back there, if you're listening to Dion, I love you too. And I said, he go with me, I didn't want to go by myself. I wanted somebody to go with me. I said, come on, man, come with me. And 
I came up here and I stood between the two chairs, kind of right in front. I'll never forget it. And it was like a magnet. It's like my hands were steel and a magnet grabbed them and just, boom, my arms went up and I just started speaking in tongues right there, prayed through the Holy Ghost. I don't know. God deals with us in different ways. I don't know what your situation is. I don't know. But there's got to come a time where you come to yourself and you realize, I need God. Right. I need His power. I need right. His Holy Ghost that I keep hearing about. Yeah. And the thing about it is, if you experience, we could tell you all day long. We could tell you till we're blue in the face about the Holy Ghost and how right. beautiful it is. Yeah. But until you experience it for yourself, you'll never know. Right. When I prayed through this sickness, so I'll get back to the sickness part. When I prayed through right there, the sickness was gone. Oh, yeah. Gone. I can't explain it. I don't know. And that's how I know that God was dealing with me. He was just, you know, you, nobody could find The doctor said I was good. But I knew, I knew something wasn't right with me. And the Bible says in, in 2 Peter 3, 9, it's not his will. This is the last part of that scripture. But it, it, it's not his will that any should perish. Right. He don't want you to perish right. this morning. But that all come to repentance. Oh, yeah. All come to repentance. And that meant me. Even I went 170 miles or so away from here, trying to run, trying to do my own thing. But even that far, and that's not far. A lot of people run farther. But even then, he still drew me back. Right. And I'm thankful this morning. I'm thankful. Yeah. He gave me a chance. Luke 19.10 says, For the Son of Man has come to seek, to seek, and to save that which is lost. If, you, if you're in a lost state this morning, God's seeking you. Yeah. Yeah. There, may, there may be things in your life coming. Right. There may be, uh, you, and you don't know why. You don't know why these things are happening. But it may be, it just may be that God's trying to get your attention. And if you get to the point where I was where you're just tired of it, and you say, okay, God, I'll give you a try this morning. You, you ought to do that. You ought to respond to it. Yeah. You ought to respond to what he's yeah. dealing with you for. Yes. And... You know, this repentance thing, this Holy Ghost thing. Uh, what is it? Well, repentance, we all know. We hear it all the time. And we're always going to hear it. Why? Because we want you to experience it. Yeah, right. We don't want to just experience it for ourselves. We want you to experience it. But repentance is asking forgiveness. It's asking God, hey God, I'm sorry. I won't do it again. You turn away. One aid, and you walk away from it. And you get baptized in Jesus' name. And the Holy Ghost comes. Um, I pray this morning. I'm done. I pray this morning that my words may help you. I know it's not much, but in my feeble way, I hope that somebody comes to their self this morning. Amen. Yes, thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Lord. Praise the Lord, everybody. Praise the Lord. Thank you, Brother Roy. That was wonderful preaching. Yeah. Well, there was a day I came to myself. The law had a little bit to do with it, but it was mostly God. God controls everything. Yeah. Every situation, he's in control of. Thank you, Brother Roy. Um, if you, I have a few prayer requests I'd like to mention this morning. Sister Lupe would like us to pray for her Uncle Salvador and his wife. Sister Beverly wants us to pray for Dalton, Raiden, Dana, Kira, and all their family. Sister Veronica would like us to pray for her sister and her family. Please pray for Sister Charity, her recovery from surgery and her Bible studies and her family. But also Sister Wendy Hoyt's very sick. She needs prayer. So let's keep these in our in our in our prayer, in our thoughts when we pray. Pray for these people. Sister Vicky as well. Um, I have a, a couple things I need to talk about. We have, the church building is closed down to the public. Um, I don't think the government could actually shut us down um, if we wanted to fight it. But we're doing this out of compliance, mainly because we're trying to be a light. This is the Lighthouse Church. And if we are in defiance to our government, then that's not a very good light to the people around us. Right. And 
the people that see us being defiant, you know, could use that against us, and that's not a Christian way. Even Jesus Christ was subject to the laws of the, of the land of his time. And he was God. He is God. And so we should be subject to our governor and, the, and what she imposes on us. And it's not fun. Don't get me wrong. I'm not, this is not fun. It's not fun to have church online. Um, it's not fun to be pretty much the only one here this morning. Um, nothing's fun about this. There's no, nothing is fun. I mean, the only fun thing I can think of, of this is I get to spend more time with my little girl. Because she's home and I'm home. But other than that, that's the only bright spot in this whole scenario. But well, the reason I'm saying this is because we've had some young people in our church that have come and opened our gym. And we're playing ball in our gym. And you know that you shouldn't do that. That's in direct defiance of not only our government, but of our church, your pastor, your bishop, every leader you have in your life is direct defiance. And that's wrong. Not only is it wrong in God's eyes, but it's wrong in my eyes, it's wrong in your bishop's eyes, and you should be ashamed of yourself. And if you do it again, I'll shut the gym down for a year. You think a couple months, weeks is bad, no ball. It'll be a year, no ball, 365 days. Not one ball will get bounced in there. I'll lock it up. And I might even have you arrested. That's how mad I am about it. That's how angry it makes me. Because that's breaking and entering. Because the gym is closed to the public. That's all I'm going to say on that. I have another announcement. If you want to give tithes and offerings, there's a mail slot in the my mom's office door there to come in the main foyer. Um, you can drop your tithes and offerings in there. Make sure they're in an envelope or a piece of paper with instructions written on it. You can also mail them to the church, 10501 West 1st Street, Island City, Oregon, or the Grand Oregon, 97850. And if you have PayPal, you can send it to PayPal. It's lighthouse238 at msn.com. If you send it to friends and family, it won't cost you anything. If you have any questions, please contact Sister Wendy at 541-975-3837. She's sick, so you might want to call my mom, 541-786-2420, Sister Parker. Let's turn to the Word of God this morning. We stand to your feet. We'll read a few scriptures and I'll let you sit down. Galatians chapter 5. We're going to start at verse number 13. For brethren, ye have been called unto liberty. Only use not liberty for an occasion to the flesh, but by love serve one another. For all the law is fulfilled in one word. Even in this, thou shalt love thy neighbor as thyself. Lord, we love you this morning. We ask that you come and you speak to us in the remainder of this service. We thank you for what you've already spoken to us. Lord, open our ears and we can hear your word. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. You may be seated. Amen. So, he addresses this setting of scripture to the brethren, which would mean the church. And with what Brother Rory was talking about, being part of the body of Christ. Um, if you're not part of the body of Christ, the main way you get in is you read and obey Acts chapter 2, verse 38. That's the first message that was preached. Peter preached it to the, Jew, to the Jews in Jerusalem. He told them, when they asked him what they should do to be saved, he told them, repent, be baptized in the name of Jesus Christ, and you shall receive the gift of the Holy Ghost. The Holy Ghost is the promise which was promised to you. Clear back in Isaiah. So, if you want a Bible study on that, you can call me. My number is 541 786-1656. I will give you a Bible study. I've been teaching Bible studies over FaceTime, and I want to do more. I have open slots every day. So call me. We'll schedule a Bible study. If you look uh, in Galatians chapter 5, verse 1, the, the first verse of the chapter we were reading out of, Paul told them to stand fast, therefore, in the liberty 
wherewith Christ hath made us free. And be not entangled again with the yoke of bondage. So, we all have bondage, or we, at some point in our life, we have bondage in. And God is a God that can deliver you from that, okay? And that's what our church is all about, okay? Our church is all about living in freedom. A lot of people think that we are, you know, we have all these rules and regulations and they don't let you do this and they don't let you do that. But on the contrary, we allow you to live a life. We provide you with means and an opportunity to live a life that's free from sin. You're not bound by sin. I don't have to get up and smoke a cigarette first thing in the morning anymore. I don't have to get drunk so I can go to sleep. I'm not bound by those things. But Paul said to stay away from that stuff, okay? Once God has delivered you from those things, then you should stay away from them. So what I'm talking about this morning, my title this morning would be, You Are at Liberty to Serve. God has given us liberty this morning to be a servant. You know, when you think of the word serve, I think of server. And everybody likes a good server, right? Or a good waitress. And I married my waitress. She don't get tips anymore, but she gets account. She gets a bank card to the account. My next server, we wanted to God. We've been teaching Bible studies too, and they got the Holy Ghost. They've been coming to church. So if you wait tables on me, you know I'm after you. But, because I like servants, okay? I like to be, I, I like to be a servant. And you think, well, you're up there preaching and telling people what to do. And No, really, a preacher is a servant. And, like, if you, if you take, think about it, when you go to a restaurant and they come up and they take your order, they go and they write down what you exactly what you want. You know, no tomato, light salt, low, low ice, whatever kind of specifics you have that you like. Okay, they go and make it's their job to make sure that those things are fulfilled for you. Well, that's my job this morning. Okay, my job this morning is to take your order. But it's kind of hard when I can't rub shoulders with you and I can't talk to you and and so. Now more than ever, I'm more relying on you know, the Word of God speaking to me and God speaking to me in prayer and, and giving and, and directing me in a way that, that I, you know, I'm, all my physical tools are pretty much gone. Like I can't use what I rely on a lot. Yeah. So, but the Bible says that we are supposed to serve each other. Yeah. It's not just the preacher. Okay? It's not just the song leader that's supposed to lead worship, okay? And it's not just the, the, the preacher that's supposed to preach, okay? It's not just the, the person with the mic that's supposed right. to be right. serving, okay? We all as a body collectively serve each other. Right. He said in verse 14 that all the law is fulfilled in this one word, even in this. Thou shalt love thy neighbor as thyself. And the verse prior says that. It says, but by love, serve one another. So, if we're servants this morning, what we should be serving is love. Love is what we're serving. The Old Testament, the whole Old Testament, everything in the Old Testament, all the law in the Old Testament, is all summed up into loving your neighbor. As yourself. Okay, it says to love the Lord thy God with all thy heart, with all thy soul, with all thy mind. And the second is life unto it. Thou shalt love thy neighbor as thyself. So, if we're not loving our neighbor, we're not fulfilling the law of God. In order to serve, you must ignore your own personal wants and needs. Okay, in order for me to serve you, I have to deny my flesh. I have to, I have to think about what you need. Okay, if I'm not thinking about what you need and I'm thinking about what I need and I get up here to preach, 
I'm not going to be able to help you. Okay? And if if somebody's reaching out to you at your job, or somebody's reaching out to you on Facebook, or however you may be community, com community communicating, excuse me, if somebody's reaching out to you, and your thoughts are all inward, then you're not going to be an effective servant. Okay? You're not at liberty to serve. Let's read on with this in verse 15. So on the contrary to, to loving your neighbor as yourself, verse 15 is, But if ye bite and devour one another, take heed that ye be not consumed one of another. So, if you are tearing down your neighbor, or you are, are being against your neighbor, okay? You are destroying your neighbor. Not only are you destroying your neighbor, but you're destroying yourself. Verse 16 says, This I say then, walk in the Spirit, and ye shall not fulfill the lust of the flesh. So how do you walk in the Spirit? You pray in the Holy Ghost. You won't have to worry about your flesh. Okay? You will have the liberty to serve. If you are praying through with the Holy Ghost, and you're walking in the Spirit, you will have the liberty to serve your neighbor. Right? Verse 17 says, For the flesh lusts against the spirit, and the spirit against the flesh. And these are contrary one to the other. So that you cannot do the things that you would. But if you be led of the spirit, you are not under the law. So Paul telling us that there's like, my dad used to explain it when I was a kid, that there's two dogs fighting inside of you. Okay? You got your flesh, and you got the spirit. Okay? And whichever one you feed the most is the dog that's going to win. So if you've got your flesh rising up against your spirit, and you're feeding your flesh, and you're not feeding your spirit, then you're going to walk in the flesh. Okay? And then you're not going to be a servant. You're not going to be at liberty to be a Christian. The fighting itself, not just who wins, even if your spirit wins, but even the Bible says that you cannot, so that you cannot do the things that you would. That means that just the fighting of itself, the, the struggle inside of you, right. is going to get you off course. Right. Okay, just the fact that your spirit is warring against your flesh, and it's such an intense battle that you can't hear the call of God. You can't hear when people are reaching out to you. Now the works of the flesh are manifest, which are these, adultery, fornication, uncleanness, lasciviousness. Those are all immoralities. Those are all immoral sins, sins against your own body. Verse 20, idolatry, witchcraft, hatred, variance, emulations, wrath, strife, seditions, Heresies, these are all sins against God and against your, your fellow man. Envies, murders, drunkenness, revelings, and such like, of the which I tell you before, as I have also told you in time past, that they which do these things, such things shall not inherit the kingdom of God. So, if you have the works of the flesh, this morning, then there's no way you're being led by the Spirit. And if you're not being led by the Spirit, then more than likely you got the works of the flesh. And when you are when you have the works of the flesh in you, when you are when you're showing the works of the flesh, okay, so trying to think of a good way to, to explain this. So, these are signs, outward signs. Okay? These are things that your body does, okay, that your flesh does that indicates what's going on in your heart. Okay, that indicates the, the condition of your spiritual walk. Okay, that indicates the, the condition of your prayer life or 
or you're, you're talking with God and the devil wants the works of the flesh. He, the devil wants you to have the works of the flesh, okay? The devil does not want you to be led by the Spirit. That's the last thing in the world he wants. Yeah. And so he's going to try every trick he knows, okay, to get the works of the flesh in you. Because when the works of the flesh are in you, the Spirit cannot abide. The, the, God cannot coexist with sin. Okay? And when you're led by the Spirit and you're praying through in the Holy Ghost, sin has to go. Okay? But if you're sinning, then the Holy Ghost has to go. Okay? They, they both can't live in the same house. So, the, the devil is, he, his main goal today is to get you to show the works of the flesh. Okay, he wants to get you in isolation. Okay, in our whole world, like we, that's that's what everything in the whole world is all about right now is, is isolate and stay home. And, and I'm not saying don't do that. I'm, I'm, I'm for that. I am behind that. I am in compliance. But spiritual isolation, I am not for. I am not, I don't think that just because you have to stay at your home that all of a sudden you should turn off the light in your lighthouse. Okay, I don't think that, that, that God called his church in 2020 to, to hide our light. Okay, we are the lighthouse church. And isolation is the playground for the devil. And they always told us in school that an idle mind is the devil's workshop. So when you have got nothing to do, okay, so if you're messing around on your phone or on your iPad or on your tablet all by yourself and you ain't got nothing good going on, nine times out of ten, you're going to end up with some works of the flesh going on. You know, it happens to everybody. You can't hardly... Go, you can't hardly scroll through Facebook, and I try hard to keep mine clean, but I try hard to be able to, to, to reach people that I knew in the world and people that I know need Jesus, and I don't want to cut their post off, but I can't be a friend with somebody that's not in church and not see things that don't lead to the works of the flesh. Okay, and if I, if I isolate myself spiritually, okay, and I don't exercise my spiritual walk and I don't walk in the spirit, then pretty soon I'm going to be portraying those works of the flesh. That's going to be coming out of me. That's a scary place to be. Let's look at verse 22. But the fruit of the spirit is love. There's that word again. Joy, peace, long-suffering, gentleness, goodness, faith, faith, meekness, temperance. Against such there is no law. Yeah. So, why does he call it the works of the flesh and the fruit of the Spirit? You know, usually when we talk about bearing fruit, we're talking about you know, having spiritual babies. And that's bearing fruit. But this fruit of the Spirit is talking about, say, you have an apple tree, okay, in your yard. You have an apple tree, a pear tree, and a plum tree. And that tree, every year about this time of year, starts bearing buds. And those buds, they turn to flowers. And those flowers, they turn to fruit. And the tree stands there like this, and its fruit's hanging off. And it's all you have to do is you can just walk up to the tree, you can just grab that apple, pull it off, you can even wipe it on your shirt. I never do. I yeah. take a bite out of it. Or you can walk up to that plum tree and just grab a couple plums, uh -huh. pop them in your mouth, and spit out the seeds. And right. You partake, you consume the fruit of that tree. So, if you're led of the Spirit, you should portray the fruit of the Spirit. 
Okay, so we already talked about the works of the flesh, and if we're past that, okay? So if, if you are still struggling with the works of the flesh, you need to pray more. You, you're you not going to bear fruit of the Spirit. Okay, but once you get past these works of the flesh, and once you overcome some of this stuff, all of this stuff, then you can bear the fruit of the Spirit, okay? You will be at liberty to serve somebody the fruit of the Spirit. Okay, so a consumer or a, a person that you work with or a person that is your neighbor or a person that you come in contact with, however you come in contact with them, okay, they should be able to walk up to you, okay, and take, look at your tree, okay, you should be a tree that bears fruit of the Spirit, okay, and they should be able to walk up to you and in a time of need like today, they should be able to walk up to you and grab some joy. Okay? And they should be able to eat. And they should be able to partake of your joy. Okay? And that's what the fruit of the Spirit should bear. That's what your job is. Okay? That's, you are a servant. Okay? And you should be serving these fruits of the Spirit to people that need them. Okay? Love is the very first fruit of the Spirit that he's talking about. And love goes a long way. If you're mad at somebody this morning, if you got some sort of whatever you got going on, that's not love. That's not fruit of the Spirit. Okay, you can take care of all these works of the flesh, okay, and let a little bit of bitterness, you know, or a little bit of not loving your neighbor take you right out of this category of fruit of the Spirit and right back into the works of the flesh. If you're mad at somebody this morning, you need to pray through it. You need to get over it. If you don't have joy this morning, I know the world's crazy. I know it's hard to look at the news and to look at Facebook or look at all these things that we're surrounding ourselves with and not feel depressed. I mean, that's the main job of the media, in my opinion, is to scare you and depress you and, yeah. and give you no hope. Because right. they don't have hope. Right. You understand what I'm saying? Yeah. You are the light of the world. Right. And you are the hope that the world needs. Right. And if you don't have joy this morning, okay, if you're moping around and dragging around with no joy, no love this morning, then you need to pray through you need to walk in the Spirit. You need to get on your knees and you need to pray until you speak with other tongues. And you need to speak in other tongues for a while. You need to stay there until you can't pray anymore. Fill that vessel up with the Holy Ghost. The world needs peace this morning. That's the fruit of the Spirit. There's no peace. The only place that's peaceful in the whole world is the church. That's the only place where there's peace. And there should be peace in your home. If you're a, a God called saint of God and you belong to the Lighthouse Church and you have the Holy Ghost, you should have peace in your home. You should be able to walk into your home and feel love, joy, peace, gentleness, goodness, faith. Nobody, nobody in the whole world will judge you for showing the fruit of the Spirit. Okay? They're not going to say, oh, stay away from that guy. He's too joyful. Yeah. Yeah. Or he has way too much peace. Yeah. You know? Yeah. That's, not, that's not reality. God didn't design it that way. Right. Let's look at Matthew chapter 10. God's been leading me, leading me to this passage of scripture for weeks now. So let's read it. It's, there's a lot in this little passage of scripture. And you can study it. And I'm sure an older, more experienced preacher could preach an hour and a half on these first ten verses. And when he had called unto them his twelve disciples, mentioned the, he, he mentioned them as disciples, okay? He gave them power, which is the Holy Ghost. He gave them power 
against unclean spirits, and you cast them out. Not only did he give them power to live above that, but he gave them power to cast them out of their neighbor. And to heal all manner of sickness and all manner of disease. Now the names of the twelve apostles are these. So, verse 1, he called the man as disciples. He gave them the power. And then he called them as apostles. The first, Simon, who is called Peter. So what's the difference in a disciple and an apostle? A disciple is somebody who believes and follows somebody. So if you're a disciple of Jesus Christ, you would be a Christian. Okay? If you were an apostle, you're a soul winner. You're a church grower. You're a witness. You're a light. The first Simon, who is called Peter, and Andrew, his brother, James, the son of Zebedee, and John, his brother, Philip, and Bartholomew, Thomas, and Matthew, the publican, James, the son of Alphaeus, and Lebeus, whose surname was Thaddeus, Simon, the Canaanite, and Judas Iscariot, who also betrayed him. These twelve Jesus sent forth. So he didn't say, come sit, come partake, come eat. No, he said, go. And he commanded them saying, go not in the way of the Gentiles or in, into any city of the Samaritans into ye not, but go rather to the lost sheep of the house of Israel. And as ye go, preach, saying, the kingdom of heaven is at hand. Heal the sick, cleanse the lepers, raise the dead, cast out the devils, freely ye have received, freely give. So, if you're listening this morning, I'm sure you call yourself a Christian. I'm sure that you are a disciple of Jesus Christ. Okay? When you're done, I'd like for you to be an apostle. Or an aspiring apostle. Or working in that direction. God gave us the power. Okay, and if you don't have the power, mention it in the first part of the sermon. Read and obey Acts chapter 2 verse 38. Call me, I'll give you a, a Bible study and I'll explain it to you, I'll pray with you, and you'll get the Holy Ghost. I promise you, if you read and obey Acts 2.38, you will get the Holy Ghost. But Jesus told his apostles to go and to preach that the kingdom of heaven is at hand. Okay, preach the world is ending. Okay, God's coming back. He said, why are you preaching? Do all those things. Heal, cleanse, raise the dead, cast out the devils. But he didn't say anything about your problems. He doesn't say anything about your spiritual battles and what you should be fighting against. No, he sent the apostles to be servants. He sent, he called his apostles, his disciples, he gave them power, and he sent them and said, go, preach, be a servant, go give. Go bear the fruit of the Spirit. He said, freely, you got this power. God gave us the Holy Ghost for free. And none of us deserve it. None of us have paid anything. There's no amount of money or there's no amount of anything you can give God to, to, to buy the Holy Ghost. To pay the, He was the ultimate sacrifice for sin. And only His blood can take away your sins and save you. So, and he gave that to you this morning for free. So, freely, you should bear the fruit of the Spirit. Freely, you should go to your neighbor, to your co-worker, and you should give. You should do whatever is in your power, whatever is you can to be the church. God called the church to give. God called the Lighthouse Church to be the church in the Grand Organ. And if you want to be part of this church, you're going to have to be a giver. Yeah. The bishop preached a couple weeks ago about him shaking off. Right. That, that God has shaken the world and he's shaking the church as well. Right. 
Don't think he's not shaking the church. He's shaking the church. And those that don't want to be part of the church, you're not going to last. You're going to have to get something in you like Brother Rory was saying. You're going to have to come to yourself and say, you know what? I need God and I need this church. I need this body of Christ. I need to show the work of the, the, the fruit of the Spirit this morning. God has provided us with the tools we need. We have everything we need. But you have to go. But the one thing we're lacking is the effort. Right. And not everybody, I'm not saying everybody. Yeah. But a lot of us are lacking the effort that we need. Right. Okay, you have to go. You have to get up off your couch. Or you have to get out of your house. You have to do what God has called you to do. You have to go. And you can heal the, the leper. Yeah. You can heal the sick. Yeah. You can raise the dead. You can cast the devil out of your neighbor. But what you lack is faith. You think, I can't do that. You can do that. You lack the faith to do it. If you don't do it, it's because you lack the faith to do it. Faith is another fruit of the Spirit. God has not given us the spirit of fear, but of power and of love and of a sound mind. Told you all I'm going to keep saying that. Because it's true. We shouldn't portray fear. We shouldn't. The church should not portray fear. Okay? Your neighbor should not see fear on you. When your neighbor talks to you or your brother talks to you or somebody in your family talks to you that needs God, they should not hear fear in your voice. They should not hear. You, they, you should be full of the fruit of the Spirit. Okay? They should be able to come. They should be able to come to you and get peace. And get joy. Yes. Let's look back at Galatians. I knew that was going to happen sooner or later. Verse 24 says, And they that are Christ. So if you consider yourself a Christian, this is pertaining to you. And they that are Christ have crucified the flesh. With the affections and the lust. So if you consider yourself a Christian, if you consider yourself God's child, right. then you have crucified your flesh and your lust and all that immorality and all that wickedness and idolatry and all those works of the flesh. You've crucified all that. That means you've killed that. Okay? You've taken that out of your life and you haven't given it any room to grow. Okay, so that you don't have that war going on inside of you. Because verse 25 says, If we live in the Spirit, let us also walk in the Spirit. So, your body and your life and your, what you do daily, the way you live, should be in the Spirit. Let us not be desirous of vain glory, provoking one another, envying one another. Don't get into a contest with your brother. Okay, that's, don't poke your brother. Don't, don't do that. Okay, that's, there's no gain in that. Let's look at chapter 6 and verse 1. Brethren, if a man be overtaken in a fault, ye which are spiritual, fruit of the Spirit, ye that have, show the fruit of the Spirit, restore such a one in the spirit of meekness, that's another fruit of the Spirit. Yeah. Considering thyself, lest thou also be tempted. Because you're a man, and you're flesh. Or you're a woman, and you're flesh. And someday, you're going to need somebody to reach down and help you back up on your feet. Yeah. Verse 2 says, Bear ye one another's burdens. And so, fulfill the law of Christ. So we should be ready to cover and, and recover our brother just like you want to be covered just like you want to be recovered when the tables are turned in your life how do you want to be treated we're the body of Christ okay? and everyone is needed we need every person we need every member of the Lighthouse Church to get on board 
We need everybody that calls himself a Christian to be Christ-like and to get on board with this and say, you know what? I'm going to bear the fruit of the Spirit. I'm going to lift my brother up. I'm going to help my neighbor. This is the law of Christ. This is the New Testament doctrine. The Bible says that no greater love hath this than a man lay down his life for his friends. That's what Jesus Christ did for you. That's what he did for me. He laid down his life. He provided himself to sacrifice. And following in Christ's footsteps, I should be willing to let God use my life. I should be willing to let God use me to help somebody else, to bring somebody else into repentance, to bring somebody else into salvation. We need to be servants called by God. The church is called by God. The church should rise to help in this hour of need. Man, this morning, if you feel like that you that you have something you can talk to God about and you feel like God has been talking to you, I'd like for us to find a place to pray as Sister Megan sings a song. Let's, let's ask God that to take the works of the flesh out and, and let us not have to deal with that struggle right now and, and let us be servants for Him. Let us be ministers of Jesus Christ.